so hey what's up guys welcome back to our youtube channel so how are you i hope you all are doing great and fine so in this video we are gonna see i mean this is a new series of uh, what if god like female naruto were fall in love with gara in a chunin exam hall so this is part one and if you want more related of this series and um, more related episode then please leave a like that will be super duper awesome and subscribe for more amazing content so without even wasting any time let's get in the video i want to go to the academy saratobi hirazin the sandai mei hokage looked up from his desk in surprise at the young girl in front of him of course one would be hard pressed to determine if it was actually a little girl or boy at first glance being as the child was only four and she was rather small from years of neglect her hair was also short, barely touching her shoulders. Overall it was rather messy and spiky, assuming she didn't attempt to tame it. She looked so much like her mother, but with her hair so short it resembled her father's in more than color. Though it was highlighted red, similar to a sunset when in direct light. Something Naruto had inherited from her mother, other than her nearly tomato-shaped chubby face. Though Kami forbid someone call her out on this trait, like her mother she had a red-hot temper though she had a little better control over it. Overall the girl in front of him was a bit of an enigma, even to him. She was unusually smart for a four-year-old, and barely cried anymore. Despite how the village treated her, despite everything he'd tried to do to keep Minato's dying wish of his daughter being seen as a hero. It was simply never enough it seemed. Very few actually did honor Minato's last request. He'd admit he somewhat regretted making it publicly known the girl was the Kikbi Jinjkriki. Many simply saw the kick be no imco. It hadn't taken him long to find out she was a bit of a prodigy, the kind that only came once every so often in a generation. It shouldn't have surprised him really, she was the last of the Uzumaki and Namaka's clans, two clans once valued for techniques of their respected villages. Though very little was really known about the Namakazes, it was determined they were ones of Wind Country, before the last of the clan fled their village, and came to Kanoha two generations before Minato was born. The blue-eyed girl's words had shocked him though. There she was before him, in an orange shirt with the Uzumaki clan spiral. A symbol still used on the flak jackets of Chknin and Jnin, to show the friendship between Kanahagakur and Yuzushiagakur, even if the ones used by Kanoha had more spirals and was a somewhat different coloration. She also wore a pair of dark grey long shorts, which made her gender even more debatable. In her arms was a stuffed rusty orange-colored plush fox. To him it just made her seem so innocent, but her eyes held such determination and knowledge, along with mischief and loneliness. She smiled and laughed and her eyes held a spark, but it only took really looking to see behind this. To see the bitter loneliness and darkness that threatened to destroy the girl's sanity. It was why he tried to help her as much as he could, she was after all like a granddaughter to him. If it weren't for the fact he was so old now, and him helping his daughter-in-law with her pregnancy, he'd have taken Naruto in himself. Unfortunately he was Hokage, and that took up most his time. With his eldest son having passed recently, leaving his wife and unborn child behind made this an especially bad time. The academy? Don't you think you should wait a year or two? You're only four now Nehru, he said, and her blue eyes did not waver as she shook her head. I want to go now. I want to prove I can be more than a pest. I'll prove to everyone I can be Hokage one day and that I won't bow under their glares, she said with strength behind her words. Strength that he didn't feel should belong in a four-year-old's voice. Yet, he knew it was a product of her raising. She'd been forced to grow up or be beat down so badly she wouldn't ever get up again. His eyes softened some as she continued. I don't know why everyone hates me Jiji, but I won't lay down and take it anymore. If I prove myself as a ninja then they have to acknowledge me for me eventually. I won't allow anyone to push me around anymore, I know I'm four, but I can do this. Please, Jiji. By the end her voice was loud and almost pleading. With a sigh Saratobi looked over at the pictures of the former Hoka gaze, one in particular of Minato Namikas, the girl's father, and he nodded. I hope you would agree with my decision, Minato. She's so young, but she's never truly had a childhood to begin with. If this is what she wants then I will allow it. He thought to himself, and then turned back to the patiently waiting blonde. Are you sure this is what you want, Naruto? He asked. Once you go there is no turning back, and if you do pass the exam the next time it is held then that's it. You'll be a shinobi of the hidden leaf, considered an adult, no matter how young you are. 
He saw a look pass through her eyes, hesitation, but it was gone nearly as soon as it appeared. I'm sure, she said. I want to become a strong Kanoichi to prove my existence to them all. I'm not a demon. She said the last part so softly he almost didn't hear her. He sighed sadly on the inside and pulled out a form. I let them know and starting Monday you'll begin at the academy. I will also go about pulling some of your parents' old material from storage. They wanted you to have them once you began the academy. I am sure this was not the aid they expected, but I think you'll benefit from them. They are your birthright after all. Naruto's eyes lit up, sparkling like sapphires placed in the sky, and she grinned. She looked so much like her father in that moment it was hard to realize this girl and the solemn girl from before were one and the same. Bowing slightly the girl thanked him and ran out of the office, probably to make preparations at the apartment he'd set her up in six months before. I hope you're watching over her, Minato, Kashina. You'd be proud of her I believe, he muttered as he returned to the form enrolling Uzumaki Naruto into the academy. Naruto nearly had to cry at the scrolls in front of her, storage scrolls and even one medium-sized treasure chest-like box that had a paper seal on the front. The old man had said it functioned much like the storage scrolls, all of which only opened to Uzumaki or Namika's blood her parents' clan names. Apparently the seals were Uzumaki designs, and not just any Uzumaki could open it, only one from the main family, or the head of the clan's family in other words. It was a seal her mother had taught her father. The Hokage only knew it could tell the difference through chakra, but it was a clan secret, and her mother had only taught her father when they'd become engaged. She still wasn't sure who exactly they were, but Jiji had promised to tell her when she was older. She figured her parents had left some sort of instructions with the old man before passing in the Kikbi attack. She saw more than many expected, and she was far from stupid, but she wasn't perfect. She couldn't see everything. Seeing what Kenjutsu could do just for storing and keeping secrets safe, she couldn't wait to delve further into it. Maybe it could help her safeguard her apartment. The apartment itself was an old building that had been abandoned when the owner upgraded. The Hokage had bought the land and building out before he gave it to Naruto. So all three floors were hers to do as she pleased. She had chosen the apartment that was largest and safest for her, being on the top floor, made it a little harder for upset villagers to get in without her realizing it. With seals she could protect it even more, but that would have to wait. She knew enough in common sense that diving headfirst into something as precise and dangerous as Kenjutsu could potentially blow up in her face and kill her. It was a tricky art, and it was probably one reason there were not many Kenjutsu masters in the village's history or present. Once she'd gotten a hold of her emotions again she'd first explore the trunk, unsealing it with a bloody thumb. Once open she could see it was rather spacious and housed many clothing storage scrolls with tags detailing sizes and ages worn. This would be good for her, if these were her mother's old clothes, then she could use them herself with some modifications. It wasn't exactly easy for her to get clothes, seeing as most shops would stone her if she came too close. Some were books, and a couple pictures of who she was sure was her parents when they were younger. Probably around 11 or 12. Her Jiji hadn't been kidding when he said she looked like the perfect blend of both, but if she grew her hair long, it would probably make her look even more like her mother. She already had the same facial shape, even if she had a slightly sharper jawline and chin, an eye shape of her mother. Her father, she was positive this was her father, seeing as his hair was only a shade different to her own blonde locks, and his skin was the same tan peach tone as hers. Even his eyes were the same shade of cerulean blue. He looked more than a little familiar, but she couldn't place where. None of it had their first names though, just their last names. She was disappointed about that, but shrugged. At least she knew what they looked like. This is great, Naruto said, grinning once more. She didn't think she'd grin so wide in a long time, not a true one anyway. Gathering the storage scrolls she knew were family jutsus and clan information, she walked over to a bookshelf that had been in her bedroom when she'd moved in. One of the leftovers from when the building housed other people. She placed all scrolls on the shelves in an order she could remember. Then placing the books which had seals on the spins that would only open to an Uzumaki's blood and chakra signature, it seemed the Uzumakis were a paranoid bunch to her on another shelf. Taking all the clothes from the storage scrolls and chest she placed them all in the closet. She'd sort through them more in the morning. She was happy to find a lot of it was more than suitable for a ninja. Which made sense, seeing as her mother was a Kanoichi herself before her death. Once that was finished Naruto walked over to the bookshelf, which was pretty full, and pulled out a worn book on Fkenjutsu. 
from the title and contents inside it was for beginners and mostly went over history. What made it different from other books was that it was written by an Uzumaki, one of the first books all Uzumakis read to begin understanding the art Uzashiagakur was so known for. Climbing onto the lumpy, yet still more comfortable than alleyways in concrete, bed she opened the book and began to read. If she wanted to be able to make her home more protected from the villagers and random shinobi who only saw a demon for no apparent reason, then she'd need to start learning now. Not for the last time did Naruto wonder if she'd made a mistake. Sure, starting the academy now sounded like a good idea, but as she stood in front of the class of kids between the ages of 7 and 8 years old, she had to wonder if she'd made a mistake. She stood before them dressed in something a little more practical to her career choice. A mesh shirt and shorts bodysuit which had elbow-length sleeves, under a dark but still bright orange-red sleeveless kimono. The sleeves of her mesh armor shirt were not seen because of the black and orange jacket she wore over her kimono top unzipped. Around her waist was a dark blue obi and black standard shinobi sandals. All but the jacket had been her mother's old clothes, but she'd used the skills she'd gained over the years with needle and thread to take in some of the size. The jacket had been her father's, which was why it was a little big on her. Like the kimono top she'd taken the time to dye it black with the strips down the length of her sleeves being orange. She'd even dyed the obi from green to blue and the kimono from yellow to orange, though she had gotten it sort of wrong making it more orange-red and brighter than she'd wanted. She'd never claimed to be a prodigy of household chores like sewing. She'd even taken and stitched her clan symbol onto the back of the kimono and on the jacket in white. For now with her hair barely touching her shoulders it was visible. If she grew her hair out she'd have to move it if she wanted it to be easily seen. Everyone looked at her strangely, probably because of her age. She was only four after all, probably one of the youngest to ever be enrolled into the academy. Everyone else was three to four years older than her. But she didn't care. She'd be five in October, and it wasn't that odd in the past for children as young as five to enroll. Not common outside a time of war, but not uncommon either. Especially for prodigies a word she'd heard thrown around, and she thought Gigi had said it in concern to her when he brought her to the academy earlier. Thankfully the sensei didn't seem to be that affronted by her. He didn't seem fond of her, but he didn't outright glare or curse her very presence either class, today we have a new student, Hiroshi said. The man was older, probably a retired ninja if she hazard a guess. Mid to late thirties, early forties at the most. Though she knew appearances could be deceiving for ninja. His hair was black, graying and rather short. His skin was tanned and seemed to have scars that were faint with age. Though one on his chin was the most prominent despite how long he appeared to have had it. He wore a dark blue long sleeve shirt and pants in the same color. Bandages were wrapped around his arms, taping the shirt down from wrist to elbow. On his legs bandages taped down his pants from ankle to shin. He wore dark shinobi sandals on his feet, and a headband was around his upper right shoulder. A standard shmin vest was over his shirt. She wondered if he volunteered for this job, being a retired shmin, or if the hokage had roped him into teaching. Huh? But she's like three, sensei. One of his students cried, and Naruto twitched in annoyance as the snickers began. She knew she was small for her age, but she wasn't that small. I'm four, databane. Naruto exclaimed, glaring at the quieting crowd. Hiroshi smirked slightly at some of the owlishly blinking students and how the girl's outburst had quieted them. Kimura Hiroshi recalled another girl with a similar personality and a verbal tick for the word, databane. A girl who he would be blind not to realize shared a striking resemblance with the blonde Uzumaki. It would also be rather senile for him not to realize both girls shared the same clan name. He recalled the fall of Yuzushiagakur, he'd been in his prime during those days, and the arrival of Uzumaki Kishina a few years before its destruction. The resemblance was only something that could be passed from mother to daughter. It was one reason Hiroshi opted to see the Uzumaki girl as herself and not what was sealed within her. There was just no way this girl was the Kikbi reborn into a human image. It was one reason he hadn't argued with the Hokage one accepting her into his class. He was a man that did not play favorites after all, and Jinch Kriki or not, the girl would be treated like any other student, by him at least. Right, he began. She may be younger, but she's here. This is Yuzumaki Naruto, she'll be here until she passes the exam, same as all of you. The silence didn't surprise him or the girl it appeared, but they seemed to accept it. Naruto, you can go sit next to. Looking around his eyes landed on a boy who seemed rather sulky and bored. Smirking he finished, Koji. 
Ichiha Koji, raise your hand so Yuzumaki may sit down. The boy jumped slightly in his seat as his eyes snapped open, and he turned to look at Hiroshi Sensei. The man had a smirk on his face, and Koji knew he'd been caught. Sighing he looked at the girl next to the sensei. Short messy, yet also tame blonde hair it seemed as if it had been wrestled into a tame style, but to him, it made her face look even rounder than it was. He thought the blonde mess would look similar, but more natural if grown out. It was an unusual sunny blonde shade with a reddish tint when light hit it in the right areas. Her skin was lightly tanned, and her eyes were big and bright cerulean blue. The oddest thing about her though had to be the whisker marks on each cheek. Slowly he raised his hand. Naruto noticed the boy before he even raised his hand. Hiroshi sensei had said his name was Koji, Ichiha Koji. She knew enough to know Ichiha was one of the most prestigious clans in Konoha, sort of like what Uzumaki was to Yuzushiagakur before it was destroyed. He had chin-length hair, sort of choppy, but it sat rather flat as well. It was dark black, but with hints of a really dark blue. She'd seen a few Ichihas around the village, and he looked like one, but his hair seemed darker, and his eyes weren't black, but a really dark gray. In the right setting they could be mistaken for black though. He wore a high-colored black shirt, and she was sure the Ichiha symbol was somewhere on it, probably the back. He had untanned cargo shorts and black shinobi sandals as well. He had bandages wrapped around his forehead, sort of like a Hittite 8 would look like if he had one yet. Here, he muttered in a bored manner, and Naruto forced back a twitch of annoyance before moving to the free seat on his right. Good, now that has been taken care of. Today we'll be going over the basics to refresh everyone's minds and work on. Naruto listened with most her attention on Hiroshi Sensei, but she couldn't help but wonder about the boy next to her. He didn't seem much like an Ichiha, more like a Nara actually. She shrugged, she didn't care. She was here to learn to be a shinobi, and one day proved to the village that she had as much right as them to be part of Konoha. If not more so considering the crap she took daily for most. Today was the beginning of everything, she just knew it. As the days passed Naruto began to realize how much hard work would have to be put forth if she wanted to pass the exams by the end of the year. She knew she had no hope of passing the one coming up in August, but the one next July would be easier if she put forth the time to train and study. On one hand it wasn't like she had much else to do besides train, and she enjoyed training. She thankfully had the help of family jutsus and history left to her by her parents. It wasn't much, mostly just clan jutsus, and most Yuzumaki jutsus were actually based in Fkenjutsu, Kenjutsu and Chijutsu. The few ninjutsus were mostly for wind, water and lightning affinities, something she'd come across over the last three months. It seemed that those three elements were most common in Yuzushiagakur, but there were not many ninjutsu specialists among Yuzushiagakur, despite the large chakra reserves of Inuzumaki. There were even less Jinjutsu specialists. Most Yuzumakis were crap with Jinjutsu because of their special chakra. Which she learned wasn't exactly just something her mother had, though the chakra chains her mother had were something unique to Kashina Yuzumaki. They had appeared before, but were rare to awaken, and only occurred in female Yuzumaki for some reason. Because of this it couldn't be considered a proper bloodline, so it was chalked up to being a part of an Uzumaki's special chakra. All Uzumaki had large amounts of chakra, which seemed to regenerate itself almost as quickly as it was used. A huge stamina was also very common, many found it hard to sit still for long because of it. Of course the Uzumaki were known for their longevity, staying youthful longer and having very long lifespans. From her mother's scrolls and books she found the oldest known Yuzumaki had been nearly 500 years old by the time Yuzushiagakur had been destroyed, but it looked no older than someone in their 90s to mid-hundreds. Though this was just what was recorded, no one was actually sure how long the longevity could last for since many were killed by unnatural causes, being a ninja clan. Some did die of old age, usually between the ages of 90 and 200 years old. Nero had even less from the Namaka side, her father had been an orphan since he was young. He barely recalled his parents, but he knew they hadn't originally been from Kanoha. He knew they were once a larger ninja clan from Wind Country, which had died out through the previous wars. While many believed it to be a clan from around Sunagakur, if not from Suna originally. The truth was that the Namakas were a nomadic clan, and had been since before the Waring clan era. The Namakas had actually been a civilian clan at first, a clan of merchants, but some were trained assassins. Over time the clan became a ninja clan of specialized assassins, a few remaining merchants by choice. Through the years they dwindled in size because of the Waring clan's era and the last three wars. 
That was everything her father had been able to find out through many years of searching. What clan jutsu he'd left her were basically his own creations and what he'd gotten from his father. Most centering around wind and lightning affinities seeing as it was the most common in the Namaka's clan. Or so it appeared. Thankfully there were a couple scrolls on Tejutsu and Jinjutsu among her father's things. Things her father had assumed salvaged from his parents before they died when he was four. This all came from the history written out by her own father, something similar had been done by her mother. She had to wonder if it was done for future generations, ergo her, and if they'd had an idea they'd not get to raise her. But that was stupid, she decided. They couldn't have known they were going to die. Her mother also had a few scrolls on Tejutsu, and even more on Kenjutsu. This was great since she could use the help in all these areas. She'd found that while she had no trouble with most academy taught Jutsu, she could not establish a bunshin to save her life. Which sucked since she might just need it to save her life one day. She had a similar problem with Tejutsu. She realized how important it was to have, and after being beaten royally by most the clan brats, including one very annoying Ichiha, she was determined to figure something out. The academy style was alright, for beginning, but she needed something else. It just wasn't something she could utilize properly, and especially not against a clan Tejutsu style like the Ichihas or Haikyuu used. Even in Yuzuka Kazumi and her twin brother, Kaisei, were able to run circles around her during Tejutsu spars. She might have more chakra, stamina and even speed in some cases, but she was useless without the skill to use it. Her saving grace were these items left to her, and she thanked Jiji for giving them to her when she'd begun the academy. Otherwise she feared it would have been a lot harder. The Tejutsu scrolls would help her with her own style and of course a clan style. The Kenjutsu would help with weapons. She had all right strength behind a throw concerning shuriken and kunai, but her aim needed some help. Breathing hard, Naruto slumped to the ground at the training ground she'd found near a wooded, deserted area. Around her was a few scrolls, most were still sealed, but one was open. It was the Uzumaki clan style. Yuzuken, Vortex Fist. The style was created in mind of the Uzumaki stamina, speed and even strength. It needed precise hits, and actually had a bit to do with pressure points. It didn't rely on these two things though. Mostly what one needed was speed and agility. Something she had in spades. As she read farther it seemed to master the style properly one needed a lightning affinity, but one did not have to mix their affinity with the Yuzukin in order to learn it. So even if lightning wasn't her affinity or primary element, she could still master it well enough. She had plans though to create her own style, mixing the Yuzukin with the Kazakin, Wind Vist of the Namaka's clan, with some more common styles found in the library. Something that played to her agility and stamina, but also mixed well with her two family styles. Later she'd be able to blend her Kenjutsu with her Tejutsu, making the style even more deadly. She'd earned the right to her existence, she thought smiling to herself. At the same time she'd make her parents proud. Hey, you're that Yuzumaki girl, a vaguely familiar voice said from behind her. Naruto's eyes widened marginally, and she jumped to her feet, snapping her open scroll up off the ground with her. She knew the person probably wouldn't attempt anything, but she was protective, if not a little possessive of her possessions. She had so few and these were the last links to her parents. Looking at the figure before her she couldn't help but glare a little. Standing there, looking bored and also a little curious, if her eyes didn't deceive her, was the Achiha boy she sat by in class. He wore the same thing he always did, it never really crossed her mind until now, how most ninja always wore the same outfit, just a fresh pair. And you're the Achiha boy, so what? She said, almost snapping. The boy blinked elishly and shrugged, sinking his hands into his pockets. Hey Chen, I just didn't expect anyone else to be here. It's usually a deserted training ground because it's so close to the forest of death. She blinked confused and shrugged. It seems fine to me. I'm Koji, he said, really not wanting to be called the Achiha boy again. He had seen enough of the blonde to know she'd definitely call him that if she didn't know his name. Naruto. He smirked and asked, Naruto? What sort of name is that for a girl, Fishcake, right? He snickered mentally as her face turned a bit red. And the scroll she held to her chest was crushed against her some. It's a great name, and it means Maelstrom, not Fishcake. She exclaimed, her eyes closed in her anger. Besides, what sort of name is Koji? And no one said Naruto couldn't be a girl's name. He smirked wider and chuckled. Fine, fine. I just assumed your name would match you more. I guess Maelstrom does make more sense. 
Though fish cake also makes some sense being a food like tomatoes are. You're sort of like a yellow tomato, he mused. It wasn't long before he realized his mistake. He backed up, his hands raised as he got a look at the blonde. Her face turned even more red, looking like a true tomato, and her hair seemed to stand up on end, like nine tails. It would be more dramatic if it was longer than shoulder blade length it had really grown in the last few months. Don't call me tomato, Adabane. She nearly shrieked, and the scroll was dropped at her feet as she moved toward him with a raised fist and speed he didn't expect. His eyes widened and he managed to dodge at the last second, but what he wasn't expecting was for her left leg to come out to connect with his knees. It would have been almost expected if it were aimed for his gut, but she'd targeted his knees. He ended up with bruised knees and flipping over in midair and landing hard on his back, head facing the calming girl how he wasn't exactly sure, it happened so quickly. She glared down at him with sharp blue eyes, and he slowly smiled and laughed. She blinked. What? What are you laughing at, Dadabane? She asked, her voice raised slightly. He stuck his arm up, his hand extended to her. You're interesting, Yuzumaki Naruto. Let's be friends, he said, and Naruto blinked again. Friends? She asked softly, her eyes wide. You? You want to be my friend? Koji sat up slowly and got to his feet, turning to face the shorter girl. He recalled she was a few years younger than him. She was four, probably close to five, and he had already turned seven. Sure, why not? I mean, you must have friends? Siblings maybe, your parents? He asked. Naruto frowned, her eyes sad, but resigned. There was also a sliver of hope behind them, but that confused Koji even more. No. I've never had friends before, she said, shocking him. What about your family? He asked. I don't have one, she said, looking over to the side. I'm an orphan. I know their last names, but. That's all. I live by myself. Koji blinked and sighed. I'm sorry. I didn't realize, he said and then smiled slightly, holding his hand out again. I'll be your friend though. Your best friend. Naruto's eyes widened as she looked up at him. Best friend. Yep, we'll be best friends, though you can have more than one. Maybe even family if you want, I've always wanted a little sister to torture, he said smirking. She looked at him strangely before smiling widely. The whisker marks on her face seemed to curl, and her eyes actually looked brighter in her happiness. Friends, family. I'd like that, she said. What about you though? Do you have any siblings? Koji laughed. Sure. I have an older brother, Shizui, he said. He's already a ninja though and doesn't have a lot of time. You can meet him someday, he's pretty laid back compared to most of my clan. Naruto blinked and nodded. What were you doing out here anyways? He asked, and turned spotting the scroll on the ground. Walking over he bent down and picked it up. He only saw the word Yuzu. Before it was snatched away by Naruto. Don't read that. She trailed off as she resealed it. Sorry, I didn't realize it was a secret, he said, figuring out it must be something rather important. He didn't recall any Uzumaki clans in Konoha, but then maybe Naruto's clan wasn't originally from Konoha. She looked down and walked over to a dark orange bag and a few other sealed scrolls. She picked them up and put them away in the bag before slinging it over her right shoulder like a messenger bag. I'm sorry, it's just. It's one of the only things I have from my parents. It's a clan tojutsu from my mother's clan, she said, and Koji nodded. It's okay, I understand. I've never heard of the Uzumakis though. He trailed off, his hands behind his head as he stared up at the clouds. Naruto twitched slightly and sighed as they walked back towards the village center. You probably wouldn't have, she said. The Uzumakis are all gone except for me, at least as far as I know. My mother was the last, she came here not long before Yuzushio was destroyed in the end of the second shinobi war, before the third shinobi war began. Koji looked at his new friend in surprise and some sympathy. You use your mother's name, then? He inquired. Naruto nodded. Yeah, I think it was to protect me though. The Uzumakis are all but forgotten, seeing as Yuzushiogakure is gone. I know my father was the last of his clan too, Namakas, but I don't know much else. Koji blinked, looking at the girl before him in surprise. He knew that name, it sounded so familiar, but where? Namakas. Namakas. His eyes widened in surprise, and he looked at the blonde once more as if just now seeing her. Her blonde hair, slightly angular jawline that would probably be less tomato-like once the baby fat was gone, and bright blue eyes. 
Hell, from the side she looked just like him, but how had none realized it before? There was only one Namek as he recalled, his father used to talk about him. A war hero, who died nearly five years before protecting the village to kill the Kikbi. Namek is Minato, Yandai Mei Hokage. Was Yuzumaki Naruto's father. Jai. Koji. Koji snapped out of his thoughts at the girl's words, and he shook his head. Yeah, Naruto? He asked. Are you alright, you've been staring at me like a weirdo for a few minutes now, she said, looking at him with slightly narrowed eyes. Slowly he smiled and nodded. He wouldn't mention his revelations to her, she'd come about it herself eventually. He also didn't think it was his place to tell her. And it was probably safer for her not to know. She'd been right to think it was for her protection. From what he knew many held a grudge against the Yandai Mei for his efforts in the war front. He'd made a lot of enemies, and those enemies wouldn't think twice about gaining revenge by killing the Yandai Mei's legacy. No, best to let her find out on her own. She was bound to after all, being a prodigy and all. Not to mention it would come up in class eventually. There was, after all, only one Namek is alive to have been her father. Bog, why did I agree to this? Naruto yelled in frustration, her hands gripping her hair as if she was going to pull it from the roots. Time had passed in a blur of monotone expectations for the young Jinch Kriki. The village had stayed the same, and as usual the stares of disgust, fear, anger, hate and coldness directed to her by 95% of the village hadn't changed. But she hadn't expected it to. What had surprised her was the increase of fearful glares she got, it was like the fact she was learning to be a Kanoichi and settle some. As if they didn't want her to become too dangerous, though she couldn't see how she'd been dangerous to begin with. It didn't matter, eventually once she was a genin, a true ninja of the leaf, they'd come to accept her. It might take her whole life, but she was optimistic it would happen. On a happier note. Her friendship with Koji, the first friend she had ever had become more noticeable. At first no one could believe the laziest Uchiha, but still a good academy student, as he didn't slack off no matter how lazy he seemed, was hanging out with the Uzumaki girl. She was sure some of the villagers had heart attacks when they saw them together. The Uchiha. Well they seemed to grin and bear it, but she could tell most of them were not fond of her and Koji's friendship. After a while they got used to her, and she could even go to the Uchiha district now, and not be stared at like she were from an alien planet. Not that her bright sunny hair didn't stick out like a large neon sign in a clan of dark broody, it is, half of them having sticks shoved up their backsides from birth. Koji had been right about his brother though. Shizui was one of the more laid-back members of the clan, and actually accepted her and Koji's friendship fairly quick. She would admit she didn't know Shizui well, but they were friendly, and sometimes he trained with her and Koji. Not long after she'd begun going to the Uchiha district she'd run into the heirs of the clan, quite literally. She'd been late for a training meet with Koji and Shisui, and she hated being late. She didn't quite know what it was, but being late made a shiver run down her spine. As for the heirs of the clan, they hadn't been as harsh about her knocking the youngest down as she'd thought. The older one was probably around Shizui's age, maybe a little younger. He looked about 11, give or take a year. He wore the standard wide-collared Achiha shirt in black, black shorts and shinobi sandals. He wore a Hitai 8 on his forehead and had long black hair like most Achiha. What had set him apart from them was the lines on either side of his face, tear troughs. They were oddly long and made him look a little older than he truly was, but not by much. The younger one looked a lot like the older, but with shorter hair which stuck up in the back, sort of like a duck's butt. His face was framed by longer bangs, not quite chin length, probably a few inches above, around the cheekbones. Both boys had onyx-colored eyes. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Who are you, why are you running around here? You're not an Achiha the younger asked, standing up with a small glare. It had been like he was trying to be upset and failing though he did seem genuinely annoyed. Naruto narrowed her eyes. I'm Naruto. Yuzumaki Naruto she replied. I'm here to train with my friend, Koji and his brother Shai. Shizui the older boy said, finishing her sentence. Naruto turned to look at the older boy the same time as Duck Butt, as she would call the brat, until she felt like doing otherwise. Shizui-san? Duck Butt asked. The older Ichiha looked down at his brother, she was assuming of course, but they looked too much alike to be anything less, and smiled slightly, but otherwise seemed as aloof as any Ichiha she'd seen. Other than Koji though he could do the same thing given the situation. Hey Chen, I've heard of you Naruto-chan the boy said. You're in the academy class with Koji. 
Shizui talks fondly of both you and Koji Kun. Duck butts eyes widened as he turned to look back at her. She's a student at the academy already, and Iki? HN, the prodigy of your generation, I think. Or at least of this year's academy students. She is the youngest, your age at Auto. The boy then nodded at her. Hello, I'm Ichiha Itachi. Duck butt seemed to twitch for a moment before nodding and introducing himself. Ichiha saws K. She had heard of Itachi before. He had been not much older than her when he became a ninja and was considered a prodigy much like herself. Personally she didn't care for the term prodigy, she wasn't doing this to be seen as a prodigy, she was doing it to be seen as a person and not a pest. After a few seconds Itachi had offered to walk with her to meet Koji and Shizui. He and Shizui were close friends, and knowing how she was already late, she figured it was best to bring her excuse to training with her. She knew from experience keeping any Ichiha waiting annoyed them, even Koji who seemed to be the perfect anti-Ichiha in the way he acted most of the time. While she got along pretty well with Itachi, though they didn't truly really have much to talk about, but the academy, and how she was doing being the youngest in her class. She and Duck Butt, or Saz K, didn't really talk the whole time. She did see the glances he shot her, ranging from curiosity, to anger, to envy. She'd stopped noticing after a while. This had all happened over a one-year time period. Time went on and eventually her fifth birthday had passed with little incident, other than the beer bottle which had been thrown at her while she was escaping to the Hokage mountain. As discreetly as possibly, the last thing she needed was a bunch of angry civilians following her up there. During the festival no one truly went up there, not that many did other days anyway. It was a good escape from the village and the mobs. Otherwise she stayed locked in her apartment which had a few seals she'd finished learning about over the year. They were just sensor-type seals, like alarms. If anyone entered with intent to harm or kill her she'd know. They were actually fairly simple, compared to most seals. Her progress with other ninja skills also improved. Tejutsu went up, and she was happy to find a more detailed scroll on pressure points to help with the Uzumaki clan style. The Yuzukan didn't rely completely on it to be effective, but it was a fairly large part of the style. One could never truly master the style without knowing the basics. The scroll detailed most the common pressure points used in the Yuzukan, but she wanted to be more advanced when it came to this. She found the answer in a medical scroll detailing pressure points, and so she changed the style ever so slightly to involve a few less common pressure points. The main differences between the clan styles she was learning to master, the Yuzukan and Kazakin, was that her mother's style was more offensive, while her father's style was a little more defensive. But both could be used for the opposite with experience and skill, or so her scrolls and her own common sense told her. While she had made progress she didn't expect to be anywhere near mastering either style for a few years. When it came to ninjutsu and jinjutsu she had done a little better, mostly because it was a little easier to train with at times. Having so much chakra. Even though she had tried as many chakra control exercises as she could find time, she still lacked fine control that others had, and it made jinjutsu her most difficult subject. Her mother's note seemed to say she had the same problem. She had so much chakra, like most Yuzumakis, that it was much harder to learn to control said chakra. The point was the smaller amount they tried to control the harder it got, while it was usually the other way around for most shinobi. Her mother's worst jutsu, like herself, was the bunshin. Something that even with a year of training she still could not do, so she'd tried to find a smart way to fix that. The answer came in her mother's scrolls. She'd found a scroll for other bunshin techniques. There was only two, three technically, which her mother used seeing as her elemental affinities had been water and lightning. Mizu Bunshin and the Raten Kage Bunshin. She'd learned that a Raten Kage Bunshin was very much like the Kage Bunshin, which her mother listed as a technique in the Forbidden Scroll. She found fairly quickly that the Mizu Bunshin wasn't very easy for her. It took control she didn't have, and she was pretty sure she had no affinity for water jutsus whatsoever. That was a shame because there was at least five Zuotin Jutsu in her mother's things. Raten Kage Bunshin on the other hand was a lot easier. It needed quite a bit of chakra, since like the Kage Bunshin it was solid until fatally injured. It also retained memories, but not as well as the Kage Bunshin. Being only five and knowing how powerful the Kage Bunshin was from her mother's notes and what was written about it, she had decided that despite having instructions on how to preform the Jutsu, she'd wait until she was older. Just in case her chakra reserves weren't large enough to handle it so young. For now learning and perfecting the Raten version was fine by her. Jinjutsu. 
well she needed better chakra control if she ever wanted to even know one jutsu that was a jinjutsu. Right now her ability with it was zilch. She couldn't even fool a three-year-old with the simplest technique currently. It didn't truly really bother her too much, she was more of an ninjutsu type anyways. Now she was two months from turning six, and the genin exam was in a week. A week before the exam and she was pretty much a nervous reek. Not only because if she couldn't pull of a bunshin she'd fail, though she figured she'd simply use the rate and bunshin or attempt to make a classroom of bunshin, instead of how man they wanted. She figured if making only three or four was a problem because of how much chakra she had then maybe if she upped the numbers, she could make decent ones. She'd tried it a couple times, but while some looked okay enough, others were gross. If she made ten, half looked dead and the other half looked semi-healthy in other words. She would need to practice more and try to gain a bit more control to have it ready in time. To top this all off she'd been roped into babysitting the Hokage's grandson. Now normally Jiji had a nanny for this, but the woman had been sick, and at the last minute he had asked her. Kanohimaru was nearly a year old, come the end of December, but he, like her, was parentless. His uncle and grandfather were all he had. From what she understood his father had died the year he was born on a mission gone wrong, and his mother had died in childbirth from complications. Currently she cursed her soft heart and the little brown-haired brat. She was too young to be looking after a baby. Ah uh ah, -uh, if you're old enough to become a genin, narrow chan, then I dare say you are old enough to babysit for a day Hokage Jiji had said, smiling. Crafty old man, she thought with a sigh. She tossed a soiled diaper in the garbage before she returned to put a fresh one on the squirmy kid. One of these days brat, I'm going to get you back for all these dirty diapers, she grumbled to the kid. Said baby, and poor soul who'd been dubbed the honorable grandson by most everyone, looked up at her, blinked, and seemed to smile as a yellow stream shot up from him. She narrowly avoided the majority of it. Unfortunately, no one told Naruto babies would or could do such a thing, much less aim. Oh yeah, one day she'd pay the kid back for this headache. One way or another. During the year she'd been in the academy she'd gained a lot. An adult, besides those at her favorite Raymond stand in the Hokage, who didn't spit in her direction. Though, Hiroshi-sensei wasn't exactly the epitome of generous either. At least he didn't try to kill her with a stare or sabotage her classwork. But back to the point, she'd gained some social skills she'd severely lacked before, and her first ever friend, she also grown as a future shinobi. She'd read about some of the jutsu her parents had made, though her mother only had one or two she'd taken time to make, and one wasn't even finished. The other was mostly notes on her chakra chains, in order to recreate them into a jutsu of some sort. Or, maybe if she could recreate them naturally. She didn't think she'd be so lucky to inherit her mother's special chakra chains though. Her father had created a few the Horatian, the Rasengan, and one or two elemental jutsus, were not being completed, much like the Rasengan in some regards. So, she decided she wanted to create a jutsu. Now, a prodigy she may be, but even she knew she wouldn't be able to create jutsus as advanced as her parents. Let it not be said Yuzumaki Naruto didn't know how to let loose and have fun every now and then. Actually, she had a fond love of pranks and tricks, just as much as she liked foxes, her favorite animal, though she'd never tell anyone but her friends, seeing as the village had a serious fox complex. Not long before the genin exams, and after a few small-scale pranks she'd decided to pull, roping poor Koji into one where she painted the Hokage monument, though they'd never prove it, she'd created her first ever jutsu, and it seemed to work. She better favored three-pronged kunai which she found a bunch of in her father's, things left to her that even in a battle it might work as a distraction. As long as it wasn't against more than two or three people, and they were mainly males. She could still recall the first time she'd used the technique, not in battle, but to see just how effective it could be. Okay, I've done it. Naruto announced as she jumped from a tree above where she and Koji trained. Today it seemed he wasn't alone, Shizui and Itachi were also present. She wasn't sure whether to be upset that Itachi's brother wasn't there or not. Naruto-chan Itachi greeted with a brief flash of a smile. Shizui returned the same greeting, but his face was only slightly more open than Itachi's. She figured that had to do with the fact Itachi came from the head of the clan and was the heir, meaning his childhood was probably filled with high expectations from his parents. It would definitely explain all the training he did. So, what have you done, Naru Chibi? Koji said, smirking at his own nickname given. Though mostly to annoy her. Naruto glared at the youngest Ichiha present. 
he knew she hated that nickname, she wasn't small, tiny or short. She was just growing slowly, that was all. I've made my first jutsu. She announced. Itachi and Shisui's eyebrows nearly disappeared they were raised so quickly, and Koji simply blinked lazily at her. She fumed, rolling her eyes, and she swore she caught steam pouring from her nostrils in annoyance. What sort of jutsu? Shizui asked, and Itachi seemed just as interested. Both had their Sharingan activated, but she didn't care, they knew if she wanted she'd tell them not to copy her jutsus. She was very possessive like that. She only did that for the few family jutsus she'd begun learning over the year, though, and her tojutsu style was so unpredictable, since it was slowly becoming her own blend of her family styles, they couldn't safely copy it competently. Then there was the respect among each other. She, Shisui and Itachi might not be as close as she and Koji were, but the forming bond was there. It's probably not what you're expecting she said, smirking. It's actually only good for a distraction in a battle with a small number of enemies. Koji sighed, he knew that tone of voice. She was up to something. What did you do now, Naruto? He asked and she smirked wider, a fox-like mischievousness that made all three Achiha's hairs stand on end. Itachi and Shisui shared a look, not liking the look on the younger girl's face. They knew very well she liked to play pranks in her downtime, when she wasn't busy training. They also had their suspicions that she had some help from Koji, though neither kid would ever admit it. Nero whatever Itachi was going to say was stopped by her technique. Naruto's hands flew into a ram seal, and she grinned in a fox-like manner and said, work no jutsu. After a three-second period the three Uchiha's eyes widened at the sight before them. It was Naruto. But at the same time it wasn't. This Naruto had to be a decade older, around 16, maybe 18 at the most. Her long blonde hair was parted in the back and tied into low, cafe-length braids. There was no longer any baby fat, she'd grown taller, probably around 5'5 five five if they had to guess. The most shocking thing though was she was stark naked, except for two rings of puffy white clouds, which blocked her breast and lower area from complete view, not to say much was left to the imagination, they could still see practically everything. Koji, being the youngest simply stared wide-eyed, his jaw nearly touching the ground in a very unachiha manner. Shisui and Itachi had the most amusing reactions though, in Naruto's opinion. Both looked very similar to Koji in the shock department, but like adolescent boys, one being around 11 or 12 and the other around 14. Blood slowly made its way from both boys' nose, signifying her greatest prank in her mind. It wasn't every day you got a reaction like that out of Ichiha. Dropping the jutsu, Naruto fell back onto the ground laughing hysterically. The best part was they'd never be able to forget it though in later years, after she'd hit adolescence, she'd wonder if that was a good thing or not thanks to the Sharingan. Koji, who hadn't activated his bloodline yet, was saved the shame of that day. Though the poor boy probably wouldn't forget anytime soon. Overall she'd gotten a very unachiha reaction out of her three friends. She'd found that if she could get that reaction out of three achihas, then only someone not attracted to the female form would be able to withstand it or someone with an ungodly amount of willpower. She'd used it sparingly though. It was after all a double-edged jutsu, and worked best on perverts, or closet perverts. She'd once used it on Hokage Jiji when he stuck her with babysitting Konohimaru and his two play dates, Mogi and Yudin. Which was really just them laying or crawling around not being older than one, or nearly one in Konohimaru's case. That day had been hell, Konohimaru was bad enough. Thankfully she didn't have to watch them for longer than two hours, two hours too long. She was pretty sure she heard Jiji muttering about forbidden scrolls and heart attacks before he was 60. She'd explained to everyone who asked Itachi, Koji, Shisui, and Hokage Jiji why she'd made such a strange jutsu. Her answer was simple. She couldn't dream of making more defensive or offensive jutsus until she understood how to make a jutsu. By making such a simple yet rather detailed jutsu, she got some experience before diving headfirst into it. Eventually time passed, and with some help from Itachi and Shisui on better chakra control, she'd got really fed up about three weeks before the test, and nearly pulverized a tree in her angry state she'd found a medium ground. If she concentrated enough, she could make seven bunshin that would be healthy enough to pass the test. They wouldn't be perfect, but as long as they were good enough, with her other scores and the number she'd create she should pass. She'd told Itachi and Shisui she could simply make a Raiden Kage Bunshin, though she'd only been able to make about five currently. 
She knew she had a lot of chakra, especially for her age, but she didn't want to chance killing herself because she overshot it. Apparently that pleased her two older friends, and by this point she could safely say she saw the two slightly distant Ichihas as her friends. She trusted them almost as much as she trusted Koji, knowing she had enough common sense not to rush into high rank jutsu so fast. When asked why she bothered trying to make passable bunshin if she could create a solid rate kage bunshin, she simply replied that she didn't want to give up the element of surprise. Considering they were ninja, this was reason enough. On the day of the exam Ruto found herself visiting Hokage Jiji before heading to the academy. So, Saratobi began, looking fondly at Naruto, a smile forming on his face around his pipe. He'd truly seen her grow up in the last year. Letting her begin the academy had been a very good decision. Her eyes didn't have the exact same loneliness they once did. He never thought he'd be thanking an Ichiha for that fact though. He continued, pushing his thoughts aside. Your exam is today. Naruto frowned slightly, wringing her hands together in front of her and nodded. Yes, I'm a little worried. You know how bad I am with Bunshin. Saratobi nodded and he knew the reason why. Kashina had been much the same, and it had only been from salvaged scrolls from her homeland and family that she had learned to make a clone. Of course hers were Kage Bunshin or her preferred forms, the Raten Kage Bunshin and Mizu Bunshin. He also knew those scrolls detailed those two jutsus, along with some brief details on how to work the Kage Bunshin, which he would happily admit had belonged to Yuzushi Agakur, before they allowed their distant cousins, the Senju, to make it a Kanahagakur jutsu. A forbidden one, seeing as very few had the chakra reserves to use it for more than five or so clones safely. Even he, the shinobi no Kami, could only make around a hundred in one go in his prime, Kashina on the other hand could make 200 and not feel tired at all. And this was before she'd become the Kikbi's new Jinch Kriki. He recalled for the Genin exam, Kashina had made the required number of Bunshin by using the Mizu Bunshin, something she'd begun learning before even coming to Konoha. It had been a bit of a shock for the examiners. But then, Kashina always said Yuzumaki's never did what was expected. They did the seemingly impossible. From what Zeratobi could recall, the only time she'd ever used a regular bunshin she'd always make way more than required. In the hundreds if she had to, but even then they weren't perfect like someone with less chakra and more control. He wasn't surprised Naruto had the same problem. He also knew she'd either use one of her mother's preferred bunshin forms, though he was hopeful she didn't try to create a true kage bunshin, yet, being so young, even with so much chakra it might hurt her in the long run. It wasn't on the forbidden scroll for nothing after all. Well, you simply have to create a bunshin. The minimum is not a rule that can't be broken, nor must it be a regular bunshin, he said, seeing no problem telling her what he knew she already knew. Naruto smiled, nodding. I know that, I'm just nervous, she said, nodding. A moment later she smiled and looked up at him. Well, I have to go if I don't want to be late, Jiji. See you after the exam. Saratobi waved after the young blonde who was like a granddaughter to him and returned to his work, frowning at the sudden awareness of the pile of paperwork in front of him. Sighing, he reached out tentatively for the first piece of evil known only to a Kage. No matter how hard they tried, no Kage seemed to be able to defeat their worst enemy. Paperwork. Naruto would deny it until her dying day, but when Hiroshi-sensei had told her she'd passed after having decided on creating 20 regular bunshin, around 13 being healthy, and the others being a little pale and slightly less spry looking. Well to be blunt, she'd almost cried in joy. She'd settled for smiling one of the widest truest smiles she remembered grinning, her eyes sparkling like crystal caught in the light. Looking at the available Hitai 8 she had chosen one with a blue fabric, but it was a lighter blue, close to the cerulean of her eyes, unlike the darker blue of the others. She had nodded at her sensei and the other examiners before walking out of the room, her new Hitai 8, the symbol of her success, around her forehead. It was only partially seen behind her bangs, but was also obvious, since everyone would be looking for it to see if she'd passed or not. I did it, she said, smiling happily as she returned to her seat next to Koji. The raven-haired boy looked at her and smiled slightly, probably the most an Ichiha would smile in public, being the proud stoic bunch they were, though Koji was always a bit more open with his emotions than others she'd met or knew. Koji himself had his own, the standard dark blue fabric, tied around his forehead much like her own. His bangs falling contently around and over it. Though it was not nearly as hidden as hers. I didn't think you wouldn't, he said. 
You've been training like crazy since I've known you, Naruto. Naruto nodded, knowing what he said was true. She had been training a lot since they'd become friends, and a lot of her progress was thanks to him. Especially her Tejutsu. If not for him training with her she'd still be training against air, and there was only so much improvement one could do with that method. Especially with the Uzumaki clan style. She didn't have many friends, the other academy students didn't outright scorn her, but they didn't actually take the time to become her friend either. Some were downright mean to her because she was younger than them. All right, well, Hiroshi-sensei began as he entered the room again, a small smile on his aged face. For those of you who graduated, congratulations. To those who did not, there is always next time. For those who did, return in two days for your team assignments. Dismissed. Slowly the class made their way out, many who had passed talking to their friends who had, and some who had passed were talking to friends that had not. Cheering them up, or trying to. Koji and Naruto were two of the last to leave, as always. You want to go to Ichirakus? Koji asked, suddenly. Naruto looked over to her friend and grinned shortly. Sounds like a plan. I haven't eaten there in a few days. She mused, and Koji shrugged. Naruto smirked and looked to her friend with a mischievousness in her eyes. Come on, I'll raise you there. Last one there has to pay the bill. She said and took off running, leaving Koji to stand frozen for a moment in shock before taking off after his blonde friend. Naruto, wait. He cried. He knew how much that girl could put away in one meal, he really didn't want to lose and have to pay for the entire bill. He'd be broke, and Kami knew that girl was stingy with her money. This is probably the most boring day of my life, Koji muttered as he laid on the ground at his and Naruto's training ground, hands behind his head and eyes focused on the clouds. Naruto twitched beside him, in much the same position, except her right leg was brought up and crossed over her knee. How that was comfortable for her he'd never know, but he'd learned in the year he'd known her that Naruto was nothing if not unpredictable and crazy flexible. Kami forbid, if this is the most bored you've ever been, Naruto laughed, smirking over at the older boy. He snorted and rolled his eyes at the jab at his laziness. He knew he wasn't the common Ichiha, but he couldn't help if he was easily bored. What do you think about tomorrow? She asked. Do you think we'll be on a team together? Hey Chen, he grunted, and he heard the blonde blow out an exaggerated breath of frustration. Hey Chen, is that the only word you Ichiha know? She grumbled. Now, Naruto-chan, that's not fair, a familiar voice spoke up. Sitting up, Naruto smiled at the appearance of Itachi, but frowned upon seeing the boy beside him. Itachi-kun, she greeted, smiling, and then frowning added, duck butt. Sasuke's face darkened and turned a light shade of red in his anger, and from semi holding his breath. Itachi twitched slightly, holding back a chuckle at the nickname his newest friend had given his little brother. Koji didn't care to restrain himself from snickering, earning a glare from the younger Ichiha heir. My name is Sasuke, not Duck Butt, he nearly snarled at the blonde in front of him. He didn't know what it was, but she made him so angry at times, and they didn't even know each other well. Maybe one reason she got under his skin was she was his age, even a few months younger. Yet she had been to the academy, and from the shiny Hitai ate on her forehead she graduated. She had accomplished what he wanted, while he was still stuck trying to prove he could be as good as Itachi to his father. Not to mention he'd heard his mother talking recently. The Hokage had asked her to take up an assignment that could be long-term, but mostly inside the village. His father wasn't too fond of the idea if the arguments he'd heard the other night were anything to go by, but his mother was a stubborn woman. He didn't think she'd give up anytime soon. Hmm, <clears throat> maybe when you apologize to the ducks for stealing their hairstyle, Naruto sniped. Koji coughed, and Itachi had no choice but to bite the inside of his cheek. Blonde witch, Sasuke muttered. Naruto barely caught it, but she only glared in retaliation. She didn't want to upset Itachi by attacking and possibly maiming his brother. A brother who was still a civilian and probably not a match for her, though she could be wrong. If he was anything like Itachi or most other Ichiha he was bound to give her a run for her precious Gama-chan. Part of her wanted to challenge the team to a fight, but the other part of her didn't think it's such a good idea or worth it in the end. Team, she shot back without thinking much on it. Itachi coughed and smirked slightly. Placing a restraining and calming hand on his little brother's shoulder. So I see you've graduated. Congratulations Nara-chan, Koji-kun. Koji nodded, smirking in such a way Naruto figured was just a way the clan smiled when in the presence of each other.
She actually didn't think she'd ever seen a true smile on any Ichiha, the closest being from Koji, and even his seemed forced somewhat. Like he was holding back. Thanks, Itachi-san, Koji replied. You actually graduated then? Sasuke said, looking at Naruto in some form of disbelief. Though he'd already deduced she had from her headband. Naruto narrowed her eyes and crossed her arms as she stood up completely. She was only an inch or so shorter than Sasuke. So she could stare him in the eyes comfortably. Yes, you didn't think I could? She asked. You're probably the dobe, Sasuke said, shrugging. Naruto blinked, and Koji cringed when his friend began to tense and turn red. Sasuke was going to wish he'd never said that. Take that back, team. I am not the dobe, databane. She exclaimed, and Sasuke, Itachi and Koji all cringed. Kami, did you have to shout so loud, dobe Sasuke yelled. Naruto's shoulders shook, but then suddenly she sighed. I hate you, team, she said, almost emotionless. Sasuke looked at her, smirked, and snorted. Hey Chen, I hate you too, dobe. Itachi sighed, shaking his head. Those two were either going to be best friends, married one day, or kill one another. Maybe all three at this rate. Then again, they might just kill each other, if the lightning exchanged between their glaring eyes were anything to go by. The day of team assignments came the next day, and she met Koji at their halfway mark, where they continued towards the academy together. Upon arriving it was obvious everyone else had the same idea as them. Wanting to get to the academy early so they could learn who their teammates would be. Sit down everyone. Hiroshi-sensei told everyone sharply as he entered the now noisy and active classroom. It was only a few seconds before everyone settled down, knowing it was never a good idea to test Hiroshi-sensei's patience. His temper was legendary, and his punishments unorthodox. He'd once made one of the troublemakers in the class run around the perimeter of Kanoha a dozen times, which was probably quite a few miles all in all how many she wasn't positive, and she wasn't sure she wanted to know. Good, now I'm going to start listing the teams and your Jmin senseis. You will meet them today and they'll take it from there. After today I won't be you sensei any longer, and you will be Jenin of Kanahagakur. I expect you to live up to that responsibility, because once you become a genin there is only two directions you can go, towards future promotions in rank or failure. Hiroshi sensei said this seriously, his eyes trailing over all of them, not zingling anyone out of his speech. After a moment he nodded and looked down to the paper in his hands which Naruto was sure listed each team. Alright then, team 2 is Yamanaka Jin, Aburam Hashi. Naruto drowned out the rest of it, thinking of other things. Her team, who her sensei would be, and even working on her first jutsu. The before mentioned jutsu was actually her finishing one of her mother's jutsus. A jutsu which would recreate her chakra chains, sort of. It was slow going, and rather involved. It seemed almost impossible, seeing as her mother's special chains were almost like a bloodline. They involved no hand signs, were powered simply by her will and chakra. But she also knew that they were not a bloodline, they were unique only to her mother as far as she knew. She would try hard though, she didn't have much to connect herself to her parents. Being able to use a form of her mother's special chakra chains, even if they weren't a real deal, would be her newest goal for the, the next year, or however long it took her. Naruto came back out of her thoughts in time to hear Hiroshi-sensei announce the next team. Team 7 will be Ichiha Koji, Yuzumaki Naruto, and Inuzuka Kazumi. Your Junin sensei will be Ichiha Makoto. The reaction was instant. Koji's head snapped up so fast she thought she heard his neck break. Her jaw nearly dropped, but she kept herself compassed enough to stop that, and her eyes widened. The last member of the newly formed Team 7, Inuzuka Kazumi, was just groaning, muttering under her breath, shooting light glares at Naruto, and curious looks at Koji. Her Ninkan companion, a male puppy with oddly bright blue eyes that looked like a body of clear blue water, sat in her lap, just as caught off guard as his partner. Why do I have to be partnered with them, sensei? Kazumi finally shouted. It was no secret Kasumi disliked Naruto, though the only reason Naruto could think of was her beating Kasumi into Jutsu nearly half a year after staring the academy. This was after she'd gained some experience in her clan styles, and Nehru figured she may have hurt the girl's pride. Though she hadn't seemed like that sour of a loser, so she could be wrong of the reason. Usually we place the rookie of the year, with the Kanoichi of the year and the dead last. This year's batch of genin are a bit odd. While Koji is the rookie of the year, and Naruto the Kanoichi of the year. You are not technically the dead last, who has already been placed. 
But you were close enough when it comes to the written and other areas that you were teamed with the two thought to help you to improve the most, Hiroshi-sensei said, shrugging. Kazumi flushed, her head lowered, and Naruto could hear a few snickers from others around them. Koji sighed, thinking of how he'd survive surrounded by so many females. Naruto was moody enough on her own. A few moments later the new genin team stood waiting for their senseis. Soon enough it was just Team 7 and Team 4. So, our sensei. She's part of your clan? Naruto asked, looking at her friend and Kasumi looked at her new teammates interested in what would be said. HN, Koji said, watching as a blonde man though nowhere near the shader brightness as Naruto arrived for Team 4. She's the wife of the head of the clan. She's Itachi and Sasuke's mother. Naruto's eyes widened, and Kazumi blinked not really understanding who Itachi or Sasuke were. She did understand the first part though, she herself was from the branch family for lack of a better term of the Inuzuka clan, her mother having actually married into the clan. That was the main reason why her senses of smell weren't quite on the same level as other Inuzuka clan members. Though only by a little, her sense of smell was still close. The other reason was she was still young, a pup by her clan standards until she hit puberty. So her senses were bound to be a bit less. I'm glad to see you three getting along, a sudden voice interrupted them. Glancing up they were met with a woman, in her early to mid-thirties, possibly mid to late twenties, though considering she had two children, the latter estimation was unlikely. She was bare-skinned, with a kindness about her unusual for most Achiha in Naruto's opinion, but also had a firm seriousness about her too. Her hair was black and long, pulled back into a low ponytail with long bangs hanging on either side of her face that roughly framed her cheeks and black eyes. It was easy to see Sasuke in the woman, they shared many similarities, like their bangs for instance and color of their hair and skin. She wore a sleeveless dark blue high-color Chinese-style battle dress with black biker shorts under it, which were barely seen from under the thigh-length battle dress. There was red edging on it, and on the left collarbone area above the heart was the Achiha clan symbol. On her arms were forearm-length black fingerless gloves, with metal plates sewn into the back of the hands from the knuckles almost to the wrist. She had on black shinobi sandals, and bandages were wrapped from her ankles to her shins. Around her waist, which was rather slim for a mother of two, she wore her Hitai 8, which had the metal plate with the leaf symbol face to the side slightly as it laid almost loosely on her waist. Situated towards the back of her left side, the opposite side as her forehead plate was facing, was a black hip pouch, similar to the two Naruto wore. Around her left thigh was a width of bandages and a black shuriken holster, again similar to the two Naruto wore on her right upper and lower thigh. Mikoto-sama, Koji said, bowing in respect. Naruto smiled and followed her friend's example. Blinking, Kazumi shrugged and did the same. Mizumaru simply barked softly in greeting. Mikoto chuckled and smiled lightly, looking at her team. It had been a long time since she'd done any sort of mission, having basically retired after Itachi was born. Yet like she'd told Fugaku, the Hokage could bring her out of retirement at any time, simply by being recalled. Usually that only happened for wars that shinobi were needed for, but there was an odd amount of Jnin willing to take a team this year. So he'd gone to retire Jnin. She was his first choice since the team would have an Achiha on it, and her Sharingan may come in handy for training Koji, should he activate the bloodline. She herself didn't use her bloodline often, she didn't like to. She liked to earn her abilities, and the Sharingan had always seemed more like a burden than a gift. An easy way out of learning, so she'd always tried to avoid using it in less than a life or death situation. Looking at her team though, she couldn't help but catch her breath at the new Team 7. She remembered when she'd been a genin and the newness to it, the excitement. She also couldn't help but linger her gaze on the girl in the middle, the youngest there. The sunset-haired girl had to be the same age as her youngest son, and as she gazed at the whisker-cheeked girl with large cerulean eyes, it was obvious. The girl was the spitting image of her parents. Her hair was to her shoulder blades, and while it was a tiny bit on the messy side, it was nearly as tame as Kashina's had been now. She'd caught a glimpse of the girl when she'd had much shorter hair, and back then she'd looked a bit more like her father with the unruly mess of spikes. Now she actually looked like a little girl, so much like Kashina and Minato it stung for a moment. She and Kashina had been rather close friends, she'd been around the same age as them, despite her husband being a few years older, and as such not in their year of new genin. She'd actually been on the same team as Minato, the former Team 7. She'd been a bit of a sullen girl back then, since her parents were arranging a marriage for her into the main branch of the Achiha, which led her to marry Fugaku. 
who would become the head of the clan by the time they had Itachi. Though it hadn't been about love in the beginning she and Fugaku had found love together, though sometimes he was a hard man to be around. Naruto, Makoto recalled her name was. Then she recalled the big stir the young girl had caused a year before, when she became friends with Koji, Shizui's younger brother. She remembered many were not pleased with the development, but soon it became a regular occurrence. Even Vugaku didn't seem to care when it came out that Itachi was friends with the girl, as was Shisui. He'd actually chuckled shortly when Sasuke had growled out how annoying the girl was and how he was going to become a better shinobi than her if it was the last thing he did. It had amused her because she recalled one of the last times she'd seen Kashina, she'd hoped that Sasuke and Naruto would be best friends and even on the same team one day. Looks like that's not to be, Kushi-chan she thought fondly to herself. Though there is still time for them to be friends someday, if they can stop trying to verbally strangle one another that is. Koji of course she was familiar with, though mostly in passing. He had the standard Achiha looks, but his eyes were not the usual black, but a dark grey that could appear black at times. Odd and unique to him she supposed. The girl beside Naruto was also a surprise because at first glance she thought the girl was Nahara Rin. In the flesh. But upon closer inspection she realized it was not. The girl had the looks of the girl she once knew that had been on the genin team Minato had taught. Unlike Nahara Rin, her hair was longer hanging just past her shoulders. It was a dark crimson and very choppy, borderline spiky. One single spike-like bang fell over her hit eye eight and laid at the bridge of her nose. Two red fang birthmarks were one either cheek and that was a clear sign of the Inuzuka. Her eyes were a sharp burgundy, almost ranging into purple they were such a strange shade of burgundy. At her side was a medium-sized puppy with golden brown fur with white fur on his paws and ears, while his eyes were a unique aqua blue. Please, it's just Mikoto-sensei when we're training, Mikoto finally said, coming out of her thoughts after what felt like forever. The three genin nodded, and Mikoto took a deep breath and nodded as if to herself. Now, let's go towards the Hokage Monument. It's where we'll usually meet if I don't tell you to go to our training ground directly or somewhere else, Mikoto said before she turned to the door. She didn't need to look back to know her team was following her. Once at the bottom of the large monument, which was actually rather secluded, Mikoto sat under one of the only large trees in the area and looked at the three before her. Sit down, today we'll just be introducing ourselves, she said, and the genin did as she asked. Like I said we'll be introducing ourselves. I'll go first to give an example. Thinking for a moment she began, I'm Ichiha Makoto, I'm the mother of two sons, Itachi and Sasuke. Before this last three days I was a retired jmin and housewife. I was recalled by the Hokage to become your jmin sensei. I like many things I guess, to many to really count. Spending time with my family is of course at the top of the list. I dislike taking the easy way out of anything, and those who don't try and make themselves believe they can't do something. Looking at the three she pointed to Kazumi. How about you go next, and then Naruto and Koji, Mikoto said, and Kazumi took a deep breath and nodded. Um, I'm in Yuzuka Kazumi, this is my partner Mizumeru. I am the older twin of my brother, Kaisei, who failed the exam this time around, she began, saying the last part sort of sadly. I like watching the stars, helping out in the kennels and training with Mizumeru. I dislike those who are mean to animals, especially dogs. I also dislike show-offs. Makoto nodded and watched as Naruto took her turn. I'm Uzumaki Naruto, and I'm the youngest here. I live on my own, and I am the last of my parents' clans. I like ramen, red bean soup, training, and orange juice. I dislike milk and raw vegetables. I also hate those who discriminate against others for things not in their control or for no reason at all. I dream to one day prove that I'm more than a pest to earn my existence, maybe even to one day be the first female Hokage, Databane. She exclaimed, a large voxy grin making its way onto her face. Makoto choked slightly on her own breath at how much like her parents the girl truly was, the best of both, though definitely with her father's coloring, even if there was traces of Kashina's red in her hair as well, and drive. H.N., I'm Ichiha Koji. I have an older brother, Shizui. I like relaxing, sushi, training, and swimming. I dislike ice cream, peppers and idiots who don't realize things won't always fall into their laps and use their family name like it can buy them the world, Koji said. Mikoto smiled softly before standing, turning rather serious. Good, I think I'll enjoy teaching you three. That is if you can pass the test tomorrow, she said, 
and smirked at the shocked looks on their faces. What? They exclaimed. She laughed shortly. Yes, you'll not like it, but usually only about three teams pass their Jmin Sensei's tests. The academy test is just to weed out those ready to become genin from those who still need some time in the academy. The real test begins tomorrow. What sort of test, Sensei? Naruto asked, a small frown on her face. A test of survival, more or less, she said. I expect you all at training ground 5 by 8 tomorrow morning, if you eat or not is up to you. You are dismissed for today. With a nod Makoto disappeared in a swirl of leaves. That was unexpected, Naruto said. I never thought she'd be our sensei. Kazumi frowned. What is that supposed to mean, Yuzumaki? Kazumi asked. Naruto blinked. You know, my name is Naruto. I don't care if you call me by it, I'd like us to become friends, Naruto said, frowning. We'll be teammates after all. And I didn't mean anything negative by it, actually I'm excited. Mikoto-sensei seems like a great sensei. Hey Chen. Koji nodded. Kazumi looked at the two and then down to Mizumeru who barked as if to agree with Naruto. Fine, she said. I guess we can try. Well I have to head home, I'll see you both tomorrow I guess. Kazumi waved as she ran off with Mizumeru, and Koji and Naruto turned to each other before heading off towards the center of the village. Things will get interesting from here, Koji said smiling. Naruto laughed and nodded. Definitely. I guess I will stop here, I hope did you enjoy this video, if you do please leave a like, that'll be super duper awesome, and if you are still watching, then comment 5 hearts in comment section. Thanks for watching, take care.